Welcome to this uh, online discussion of Marko Boitsun's new book about Ukrainian workers and the national question in 1917. We advertised this discussion as an in-person event. We had to move it online, which was a pity. But to be honest, we're so thrilled to see so many people attend this event that perhaps that was a, a very good decision uh, to, to take in the end because we're able to reach out beyond um, those people who were able to make it in person, which is great. My name is Olesa Hromychuk, and I'm uh, the director of the Ukrainian Institute London, um, which is a center for Ukraine-related educational and cultural activities. Uh, Ukrainian Institute London is a registered charity, um, and we work to broaden the knowledge about Ukraine in the UK and beyond by offering discussions such as tonight's discussion by exploring Ukrainian history, culture, uh, and current affairs through projects, through discussions, uh, and, and other activity. Uh, I'd like to highlight that we are mostly funded through our events, donations, uh, and project funding, which enable us to hold um, to hold uh, events, at least some of our events, free of charge. And tonight's uh, discussion is sponsored by Brill, the publisher of Marco's book. Um, and for that reason, we were able to not charge for it. So that's wonderful. But if you are able to make a donation to Ukrainian Institute London, uh, you can follow a link in chat um, and, and make a donation. We'll be very grateful for um, any support that you can offer. Okay, I will not take up any more of our time and I'll introduce our moderator. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Simon Pirani, who's an honorary professor at the University of Durham and senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. Uh, Simon is the author of many articles about energy pol policy and social issues in Ukraine and Russia. You will see a link to some of his work in chat, so please follow and check it out. And is also the author of um, the Russian Revolution in Retreat, 1920-1924, Soviet Workers and the New Communist Elite, which came out uh, with Ratledge in 2008. Simon, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, uh, Alessia, and thanks uh, very much, everybody, for uh, coming. I'm going to show you a picture and read you a story and then hand over to our panel. So, Alessia, if you can put the picture up. Um, I was visiting uh, St. Petersburg on the just around the time of the 100th anniversary of what, what I always have called the Russian Revolution, but uh, reading Marco's book and about the tumult in Ukraine, it clearly has to be called something else. And I was, uh, we, we saw the horrible exhibition at the, the uh, Winter Palace, which was all about the Tsar's family. Then we went round the corner to the Museum of Social and Political History, and they had a wonderful exhibition about the revolution and nothing was more wonderful than this photograph, which is uh, Ukrainian soldiers demanding autonomy, the autonomy of Ukraine on the streets of Petrograd in March 1917. And as you'll hear from Marco in a moment, I mean, these are very much the people who feature um, in his book. And it was amazing to me not only to see this photograph, I'd never seen it or indeed anything like it before, but in the circumstances, if we think about the public mood in Russia in 2017 and the uh, hostility to Ukraine, which uh, was uh, was orchestrated in many ways by the government through the media and so on, some archivists nevertheless had the cool and the decency to put this photo in the exhibition. It's a, it's a wonderful photo. And then there's a close up. I just want to show you uh, because it shows these guys are really on a day out. That's a big band in front of the big flag. You can see the big drum, and just in front of the flag, you can see there's three, uh, if not four, uh, tubers or some similar uh, brass instrument, and indeed there's many uh, trumpets and so on. So uh, this was a very impressive and very dignified demonstration. Petrograd, uh, the, the heart of the empire, uh, where the... Uh, demand for Ukrainian autonomy was raised by these uh, soldiers. So uh, that's the picture. Um, the story uh, is about Marco. Um, and just to introduce him to you, I, I can see on the, uh, the names that have come up, many uh, friends of his are here. But uh, for those of you who don't know, I, mean, I, I didn't know all this stuff before I read this. Um, Marco was born in Australia uh, to a family of Ukrainian immigrants. Uh, emigrated to Canada in 1968 and became politically active there in 1970 in defense campaigns for Ukrainian and other Soviet dissidents. And he was a founding 
member of the Committee in Defense of Soviet Political Prisoners in Canada. Uh, from the mid 70s to the mid 80s, he translated and published Ukrainian oppositionist writings and wrote about Ukraine and Eastern Europe in Meta, an English language journal. He was also one of the editors of Dialog, a Ukrainian language journal that was smuggled into uh, the Soviet bloc countries by travelers, including Marco himself. That journal was supported by uh, the United Secretariat of the Fourth International, which is a Trotskyist organization that had links also with Russian, Czech, Polish, Hungarian, and other left-wing opposition groups operating across the Cold War division of Europe. So Marco had studied at the Institute of Soviet and East European Studies in Glasgow. He received his master's degree there in 1977. In 1985, he was awarded a PhD at York University, Toronto in Canada, for a thesis on the Ukrainian workers' movement and the national question in the 1917 revolution. We'll, we'll come, we're obviously going to come back to that point. But just to finish the story of, of, of Marco, who in a way is a participant in a later chapter of the history that we're talking about, um, from the mid-80s, moved to England, worked as a journalist here on an English, English language, launched an English language magazine, Ukraine Today, wrote widely about the Soviet economy, participated in a campaign to legalize the Ukrainian Catholic Church, which was then the Soviet Union's largest illegal organization. Um, Marco made documentary films for TV about Chernobyl, uh, the exhumation of victims of Stalin's purges, and the first semi-democratic Soviet elections uh, in 1989. And he published a book on the Chernobyl disaster in 1988. In 1990, Marco was appointed at, as the UK's first ever lecturer on Ukrainian history at the School for Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of London. And this actually followed the abandonment of a long-standing informal uh, understanding between the UK authorities and those of the Soviet Union that the non-Russian Soviet nationalities should remain invisible in research terms. So the world was changing, Gorbachev was there, and uh, this was one of the uh, results. In 1993, Marco moved to the University of North London and worked on exchange projects to train civil servants in newly independent Ukraine and to facilitate Ukrainian membership of the European Union. And at that time, Marco's research focused on Ukraine's transition to the market, the catastrophic consequences of neoliberal policies and Ukraine's stormy politics under Kravchuk, Kuchma, Yushchenko, and Yanukovych. And a collection of his articles about those years, it, it, it has recently been published, 2019. Uh, it's called Towards a Political Economy of Ukraine. Now, Marco retired in 2012, and despite being beset by a long-term illness, became politically active again in support of Ukrainian workers' organizations. And he was the found, one of the founders in 2014 of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. In retirement, and this brings us to the point of uh, we're going to discuss this evening, Marco returned to his PhD thesis and comprehensively reworked it, bringing in new material about the dynamic of Jewish, Ukrainian and Russian workers' organizations prior to 1917 and about events that followed the revolution, including the disintegration of the Russian army and the pogroms. And it's that work, which was first published in Ukrainian last year, and now uh, appears as the workers' movement and the national question in Ukraine, 1897 to 1918. So we've got uh, Marco here and two other very uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, Yuli Yurchenka and Christopher Ford, who are gonna uh, speak with you. Um, I'll go straight now to introduce Marco, who's gonna introduce uh, some of the themes of the book. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Simon, uh, for that introduction. Uh, let me thank uh, Olesha Khromichuk uh, and the Ukrainian Institute for organizing and hosting this event. Um, uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to say a little bit about my book, um, and I'm eager to hear um, the reactions um, of members of the panel tonight uh, who have had an opportunity to read the book. Um, so large. 
Excuse me. I think that was someone. Someone unmuted the mic briefly. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So let me say a little bit about the book then. Uh, it, I, I, why did I start uh, working on this topic uh, in 1977? As you heard from Simon, I was already quite active uh, politically and the, uh, the national question kept uh, returning uh, to uh, public debate, uh, to disputes. Um, that involved uh, Ukrainian nationalists who are dominant in my community in Canada, um, Stalinist um, organizations um, in Canada, but uh, uh, official uh, uh, figures uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and of course, um, there was some addressing of um, the um, Ukrainian question um, in a historical sense, uh, by members of uh, Western uh, intellectual circles, uh, both left-wing uh, and right-wing. And none of them, none of these um, intellectual currents commenting on the Ukrainian national question really satisfied me in explaining why this question persisted, what was its nature, um, how could it be resolved? And this was a, a, this was a pertinent uh, issue uh, for uh, myself personally and the political groups that I was involved in uh, at the time. Uh, I wrote I wrote the book uh, over a long period of time, about fifteen years in total. Uh, I spent on it, uh, and it's essentially made up of two parts. One is a concise uh, economic, political. Uh, historical and social analysis uh, of the national question in the period leading up to uh, the 1917 revolution. Uh, and uh, it focuses uh, on the emergence of a multinational working class uh, and the uh, oppression um, of Ukraine um, as a territory, as an economy, uh, as a population uh, on the eve um, of 1917. The issue um, explodes uh, in 1917 simultaneously with the explosion of a social revolution the overthrow of the Tsar, um, uh, the beginning um, of the long um, change that takes place uh, until the fall of the provisional government in October of 1917. That is to say that the national question and the social question um, grips um, the masses of the population, the workers and the, and the peasants, and they seek a simultaneous resolution of these two questions alongside the other big issues that uh, face the masses at the time, which is the demand to end the world war, the demand to distribute land equitably to the peasantry and to create a viable democratic participatory governmental system. The second part of my book, which it takes up three quarters uh, of its length, uh, is a blow-by-blow blow narrative of the first year of the revolution from February 1917 to the end of April uh, 1918. And here I uh, examine the way in which uh, Ukrainian, Jewish, and Russian social democratic organizations uh, attempted to address uh, the Ukrainian national question and to resolve it as a issue of state power, as an issue of the destruction and creative reconstruction of government. Uh, and that took place um, through the Central Narada, um, and later, um, the 
Soviet Ukrainian um, government that was created in Kharkiv at the beginning of 1918. Both governments declaring themselves the, the legitimate uh, governments of the Ukrainian People's Republic. So three quarters of the book is really a close uh, historical narrative. Uh, I'll just uh, mention some of the highlights uh, of that year uh, and without sort of drawing any firm uh, conclusions or making any assessments. And I'd like to take it into a general discussion and to hear, hear the other members of the panel um, speak um, to the issues of, of this book. One, uh, as I already said, <coughs> whereas uh, social democracy historically um, thought that um, the, uh, they would be first a bourgeois democratic revolution, which would be followed later by a socialist revolution. In fact, both of these came at the same time. Uh, and uh, both of these um, processes of demands for resolving the social inequalities and the national inequalities through some kind of viable government um, gripped the same people, the same workers and the same peasants. Uh, and that is a significant fact. They, they weren't waiting for some kind of stages um, of, um, of historical change. Uh, they wanted those two things immediately. And this fact, uh, overthrew or uh, repudiated uh, the expectations of the social democratic workers movement up to that point in time. And they had to address these questions simultaneously. And they addressed them with great difficulty. Um, the main reason why they addressed the national question with great difficulty was because Marxism had bequeathed to them uh, two visions of the future under socialism. One vision um, argued that um, nations uh, would be reduced radically in number um, as capitalism developed uh, and socialism was in the offing, down to five or six nations in the world, and they would be the nations of the, those that had states of their own. And the stateless nations would be absorbed, would be assimilated into these leading so-called historical nations. And their languages would die, their cultures would die, and five or six major languages and cultures would survive in the world. That was one view that came from the early Marx and Engels and was taken on by different um, uh, Social Democrats like Rosa Luxemburg, uh, V.I. Lenin, uh, Karl Kautsky. The second view um, of the future um, of the world under socialism would be that nations would flourish. All nations would flourish. Their languages would develop. And all of them who were stateless would demand a state or some kind of independent government of their own. And this was the view uh, commonly known as Austro-Marxism. The first view was adopted of the, of the socialist future, was adopted by Russian social de democracy, mainly by the Mensheviks, but also to a great extent by the Bolsheviks. The second view of Austro-Marxism about the flourishing of nations under socialism uh, was bequeathed to uh, the, uh, the Bund, uh, the Jewish General Workers Union, um, and the Ukrainian Social Democratic Workers Party, and quite a few other social democratic parties of the Russian Empire. This is evident. This, this duality um, comes through in the programs, the organizations, and the strategies of the social democratic parties active in the revolution of 1917. 
and is the source of many different conflicts uh, between them. Um, second uh, highlight I'd like to mention here is that the Central Narada, which we commonly refer to as a Ukrainian government uh, of the Ukrainian People's Republic, was in fact, after August 1917, a government made up of Ukrainian, Jewish, and Russian social democratic and socialist revolutionary parties. Uh, it was a government of Ukraine, but it was not a Ukrainian government per se, insofar as Russian and Jewish and Polish political parties participated in the determination of its policies regarding the war, the distribution of land, um, um, minorities policy, Ukrainian autonomy and independence. Um, furthermore, as far as the dynamic of the revolution in 1917 is concerned, the soldiers movement, which is much neglected in the literature, played a critical intermediary role in the cities between the workers on the one hand and the peasantry on the other. Because the soldiers were overwhelmingly from the peasantry, they had a link to the land and they played a positive um, reinforcing role in forging the unity um, uh, in the revolutionary process in the first part of the revolution in 1917. Later, they were to play quite a destructive role when uh, the soldiers um, in a number of armies, the army of the Central Narada, um, Bolshevik forces, um, and other paramilitary groups uh, were responsible uh, for the murder of Jews in the pogroms that broke out at the end of 1917 and went on all the way um, into 1918 which I cover in the book. But the soldiers are a critical force, uh, the soldiers' movement uh, in, uh, in, in this process. Furthermore, um, in the relations between the political parties, the Bund played a very important role as an intermediary in reconciling the Russian and the Ukrainian social democratic parties and the Tsitray Narada with the provisional government. And the Bund was responsible for persuading the provisional government to first grant limited autonomy to Ukraine. Uh, and the, um, and in, in the initial period, uh, the Tsitray Narada uh, responded uh, to this positive convergence uh, between the, uh, the Jewish, the Ukrainian, and the Russian parties by uh, developing a practical program of national autonomy uh, for the minorities. Uh, and uh, that program was elaborated, uh, prepared, and partially implemented, first and foremost, by the Jewish community. Uh, The, there was a very promising opportunity in November 1917 to resolve the whole Ukrainian national question by the formation of a government made up of the representatives of the workers, soldiers and peasants councils in Ukraine. Uh, the demand for such a government was put forward by seven out of 10 of the biggest uh, workers' councils, in, urban workers' councils in Ukraine, and by the overwhelming majority of the peasant councils and peasant organizations. It was not a proposal put forward by the political parties, but by elected deputies of workers and peasants and soldiers. And that uh, demand and that push for uh, government of workers and peasants and soldiers uh, failed because the political parties in the Central Narada could not agree to it and because the Bolsheviks 
refused to take part in it and set up uh, a competing rival government in eastern Ukraine, in Kharkiv. So, these are some of the highlights um, in the uh, second major part of my book uh, that were uh, a revelation to me, uh, were new things uh, that I couldn't find, I hadn't found previously in the literature. And so I've spent uh, quite a bit of time looking um, at those. I'll wrap up there and just say, I've drawn no firm conclusions from my historical narrative. Uh, I, to be quite honest, I'm still rereading what I've written, trying to understand, you know, what are the lessons from this period of time. And so I'm relying um, on the readers of this book and the discussants such as you here tonight um, to contribute to an understanding of what went on and to use my book um, as raw material and as an initial analysis uh, in that process. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Marco. Um, a lot there. I'm going to move straight on to uh, Yulia Yurchenko. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in political economy uh, at the Institute of Political Economy, Governance, Finance and Accountability and the Department of Economics uh, and International Business at the University of Greenwich in London. Uh, Yulia works on the political economy of geographic Europe and the post-Soviet space, particularly Ukraine. She's the author of... Uh, Ukraine and the Empire of Capital from Marketization to Armed Conflict. Uh, that was published by Pluto uh, in 2018. Um, Yulia, uh, I want to, I, I, I'm, I, I want to ask you, um, you're the, you're the only uh, member of the panel educated in the Soviet Union. Um, how has your view of, of 1917 changed? Because uh, that's obviously that will have been part of a, a social process. How have you seen views in Ukraine generally change um, o o over recent years? And where does Marco's contribution uh, fit into that? And if you can, and, and both uh, Yulia and Chris have been given by my questions absolute mountains to climb, um, but if you, if, you, if you want to also talk about 21st century Ukraine and the successes and failures of nationalities policies uh, now, uh, please tell us about that as well. Yulia. Oh, yeah, I'm allowed to unmute myself now. Um, thank you very much, Simon. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm going to need to write another book too. Answer that question. Um, thank you very much, uh, the Ukrainian Institute. Thank you very much, Alessa. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, organizing this absolutely amazing event. Um, and Marco for writing this absolutely fantastic book that um, I've got here. I'm writing a review for the Capital in Class. So I'll, I'll, I'll say more there. Um, so I will talk. Um, I will talk about the relevance for today. It's kind of, I like to mesh things together. So hopefully I will answer your super complicated and big question, um, Simon. Uh, not unlike you, when I was reading Marco's book, I was thinking, okay, can we keep calling it Russian Revolution? Because uh, I kind of, I was never quite easy, but not never, not since I was little, uh, Ben. But, um, you know, I uh, as I started... Uh, reading history at school like it's like well, yes, there is a bit more to it so you know I went to school I wasn't I, I only went to school in 89 and before that I was homeschooled but I was I was grew up in Vinica which is a Ukrainian speaking part well Surzhik speaking part uh, of Ukraine but it was you know it was part of the Hetmanet and this and that and the other like there were a lot of different uh, interesting historical uh, developments there in Ukraine and of course there is a border with current Moldova and uh, you know you name it so it was quite interesting and I remember very very vividly kind of history being rewritten as I was growing up where I went to school at 
was still USSR, and within a couple of years, uh, books were ripped apart, and new curriculum was being developed. Uh, and you know, like, uh, uh, of course, my relatives fought in the Second World World War, and one of my grandfathers. I was too young to fight in the World War, but great grandparents had lost in the in the Second World War on the front, and I also lost relatives to Stalinism. Uh, but the grandfather who fought uh, with the Soviet army um, had conflicted feelings about Oun Pa. So, like Oun was something that was in school sold as uh, as it was a good as it was a good thing that kind of didn't happen and it was already the history the curriculum was rewritten in part to to reflect uh the uh, uh, kind of the rapprochement of ukrainian historical science with the diasporic science that was not as easily available of course under the soviet times and you know during prehistoric certain things were a little bit easier but not as easy as one would want them to be but i remember the uh the, the narratives about uh upa and san heroes so to speak who were written out of history and i was wondering why what's what's happened that seems unfair what was go what why were they written out of history what was going on and i was asking these questions and uh you know as as very often and goes with this uh, in books and in conversations that they were dealt with with a lot of silences and a lot of uh, kind of unclarity so to speak um, and I've learned more about uh, about what was what was shaping these changing narratives within Ukraine uh, and change and uh, kind of and the in, the influx of different ones uh, in it. Um, when uh, I've moved to the UK in 2004, because uh, when I, I studied at uni, I studied linguistics, but it was you know it was Kuchma's Ukraine was very complicated. Um, but uh, when I started studying Ukraine properly, I started engaging more with literature, including Marcus literature, and, and all of these events and historical books in school started making more sense. And Marcus, Marcus' work was absolutely crucial in making sense of it. When I was writing my master's and then PhD at Sussex, uh, and I, I wrote my master's about Orange Revolution, but it was also kind of like, you know, there were the language question was a problem and um, whether whether Ukraine should go east or, or west, uh, all of those questions were very important. And it's, it's not necessarily very easy as we can see from the news amongst other to make sense of any of it. So in to that to that end, Marcus' work it was extremely important. I'm going to, in the last two minutes, <laughs> try to explain why exactly that is important and what kind of lessons are there for, for uh, Ukrainians, for citizens, for historical or materialists or any other scholars of contemporary Ukrainian history. Uh, are there for for those who are trying to make any sense of what happened after 91, 91 and post to southern Seretin, because it is extremely relevant. I'm going to, uh, Marcus Muk is extremely relevant. I'm going to read from page 301 on the national identity and political allegiances. As the conflicts intensified, people in leadership positions described the enemy as the other side, uh, increasingly in national terms or a combination of national or class terms. Their characterizations ranged from simple identification of nationality to chauvinistic and racist descriptions of Ukrainians, Russians, and Jews. It could have been from a newspaper today, couldn't it? Very easily. And why it all happened is because the class solidarity that has emerged through the uprising, through fighting against the bourgeoisie, through uh, the frustration of soldiers coming back from war, that started falling apart. And this kind of break away into pitching, pitching each other into different identities started to happen. And Marco documents it so very well. And I think there is so much to learn for the scholars of contemporary Ukraine. I, I focus more on contemporary Ukraine, of course. And what we see now in Ukraine is there is a, there are a lot of attempts to rewrite history in a much more serious and deliberate way, not least through the Institute of National Memory, there was, you know, there, there was this figure of Vyatrovich, very, very influential there, where there's, there are a lot of attempts to uh, to provide this kind of simplistic nationalistic sentiments and draw some lineages that run all the way from Kiev and Rus, Rupa versus Bolsheviks. And uh, that doesn't help us understand the, com the contemporary complexities of the national identity and sovereignty struggles in conditions of imperialism all the new. It really doesn't help us. And I think my does such a great job of going all the way from the Kiev and Rus times to uh, the fall of the Rada. 
discussing how these, uh, where the class dimension in all of this is, and actually showing uh, where, where, not, where not just the national narrative, but class narrative, and the class analysis is so sorely needed here indeed. But the national question as well is very often kind of being seen as incomparable or, um, with, with the class dimension. And I think Mark also does such a great uh, job of, and you, you already spoke in his introduction about talking about the different uh, conversations and different visions of the role of the national question in sovereignty building. That is again, so pivotal today uh, in Ukrainian narratives um, uh, and, and in nation building. And that national question, when it is connected to the workers' rights and sovereignty in the context of capitalist imperialism, be it Western or Russian variation, takes on different shapes in the context of Marcos work. And indeed it opens an opportunity for a different um, and more progressive and a truly autonomous vision of the future for the Ukrainian state that is not linked to however poorly demarcated boundaries of ethnic, linguistic, religious, or cultural Puritan identity of, of the Ukrainian. Uh, as important that those social group and identifiers are to individuals, there are many of them in any workers, in any worker nation, and Ukraine shall not fall into the trap also of Western post-colonial studies or movements uh, where they often end up, where, where the Ukrainian identity begins to be identified as uh, as the other of the oppressor, as, the, as something that is different to it. And in that kind of exercise, one can never really become independent in any meaningful way, and instead is permanently obligated to define and redefine oneself, oneself by a negation of the image that is designed by colonizer. And that kind of those narratives about how the national question needs to be needs to be framed also speak to that in Marco's book. Crucially, what his work shows is that Ukrainian workers had his historically showed a lot of solidarity, as well as antagonisms, including between the peasants and the city dwellers. Even in the conditions of war, there, there were attempts at, at making, uh, um, at, 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 at building dialogue, there were attempts of working together. And it's, and it's when, they, when there was this fall into, when, when there was a break of that understanding that it is the class struggle that is most important binding uh, material between the workers, that's, that's when the weaknesses were shown. Um, and, if, and, uh, and so when these, um, when, when, those, when, when we understand in the historical context that there were serious attempts being made at, at building multi-ethnic worker state, they seriously were made historically, unlike uh, like different uh, historical narratives and historical books that we read that it was all about Ukrainians or it was all about Bolsheviks uh, and Russians and Jews being in control of Ukrainians. There are all sorts of theories and uh, conspiracies going around. We see through this book meticulously documented the actual nuance and complexity of solidarities and also antagonisms in this um, in these struggles. And so uh, what we also to see very important in this critical class dimension and this is also where the relevance for contemporary ukraine is because when we understand the negation of any attempts to retrospectively uh, kind of pitch different historical groups together, as well as show the main struggle historically a class struggle. We understand that it was it was always between the workers and the bourgeoisie and serfs and owners and landlords, be they Polish or Russian. Uh, the, there are manipulation of peasants and serfs and Cossacks in the in the resource grabs. And then when we also see that U Ukrainians were not united themselves, there was a lot of infighting amongst ethnic Ukrainians, and there were unfortunate alliances being made. And there is a lot to learn from that and to a large extent that is what stands in the way of a meaningful independent sovereign Ukraine today. The book shows that historical precedent, the historical precedence of the need for solidaristic workers movement against local and global capitalist class and the importance of the national que question uh, a place and a place of it uh, that would nurture cultures without driving divisions amongst the workers, because that is the passage that I read, that is precisely when, where those, I think, divisions are so well demonstrated. And, I can, and, and to that extent, I cannot think of a more, a more relevant book for Ukraine building today, because it is those divisions and some sort of anachronism that, have been, that are driving a lot the political discourse. And it really stands in the way of the solidaristic move to, towards rebuilding economy, drawing workers internally and those who, have, who keep emigrating in waves uh, to building uh, to building a Ukraine that is not serving oligarchs, serving oligarchs, but serving hardworking Ukrainians who want to build a better life. Thank you. Thank, th <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Yulia. And uh, for for people who haven't had the chance to read the book, the, the passage that Yulia spoke about, where these divisions really reappear 
uh, in this aggravated form is the chapter which deals with January 20, uh, January 1918. Um, so that you've had this moment of hope that Marco referred to in November 1917, this opportunity which uh, he has said to you could have been seized at that point uh, to solve the national question along with many of the social questions. And by the time we get to January 1918, and this is why Marco's extremely detailed narrative is so compelling because the, the things were changing so quickly, you, you move on a couple of months. Uh, the, the hopes of unity are broken down. The Bolshevik, the Red Army and the Rada are uh, at each other's throats. And it's at that point that, that, that these national narratives uh, supersede. Uh, the class narratives. Right, moving on, uh, uh, our next panelist, Chris uh, Ford. Uh, Chris is an organiser, is the organiser, sorry, of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. He's written uh, books and articles on Ukrainian labour history, including uh, Ukapism, uh, a, a, a lost left Marxism, uh, anti-colonial Marxism in the Ukrainian revolution. Uh, that's been published in French. Uh, he's also editor of a an edition uh, of a book by Ivan Maestrenko that came out, uh, ooh, I think it must be 10 years ago or so now, uh, uh, Barotbism, a chapter in the history of the Ukrainian revolution. So, uh, Chris, um, I, I, I've again got a, a, a mountain for you to climb. Uh, um, I, and I want to ask you um, what, what you think Marco's work says about this relationship of, of national movement and social revolution. Why did this, why did we reach that point in 1918 of, of, of failure, uh, failure to achieve national independence? And also, can you compare it with movements that you've also studied in Ireland and Scotland, which are our own uh, national questions here in the UK? Uh, Chris. Thank you, Simon. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, it, it's a good question, the relationship of the national and the social. Uh, Ivan Zuba, the famous dissident, uh, argued in his uh, celebrated work, Internationalism and Rustification, that the national question is simultaneously a social question. And uh, Marco's book digs deep on this aspect, set in a historical context, which is crucial for us to understand the Ukrainian revolution of this period. From early on, uh, the emergence of the Ukrainian movement in the 19th century through Ukrainian social democracy, they had sought to move the quest for national emancipation beyond a sol solely a cultural dimension uh, of issues of Russification of language to an issue of social emancipation. Uh, and this comes very much to the fore of this journey in, in reading this book. Uh, the combining of social emancipation and national emancipation uh, is a goal to be realised uh, in that revolution. And whilst we have a, a greater appreciation of the Ukrainian peasantry uh, as a national question with a largely non-Ukrainian uh, class of landlords, much less had been written before, I think, until this book on the, the national question uh, and, and the proletariat of Ukraine. And this book invites us to see the colonial position of Ukraine, how it impacted on state, capital, labour relations, and the composition of social classes as a totality. Uh, the bourgeoisie was often referred to as a non-Ukrainian, as Ukraine as a bourgeois country. Uh, and but, uh, in terms of the working class, reading this, we also see it bears the stigmata of colonialism too. Uh, this wasn't formed by a single transfer of the peasantry to the proletariat. Uh, the industrial centres, the Ukrainian uh, peasants moved to to become workers, found Russian hegemony in the factory and in the labour plant management. Uh, increasingly, a Russian and Russified upper strata developed in the higher paid and skilled jobs. Ukrainians found language, uh, Russian to be the, the language of the state, of the labour regime, of the factory owner and the foreman. Uh, uh, and this posited the national question at the point of production. Uh, uh, a snapshot I found there was of a flexible labor was very present amongst Ukrainians of this time. And in Donbass, 
virtually all temporary workers in factories were Ukrainian uh, uh, at the time. Uh, so as a nation of workers and peasants with no arguably nationally conscious capitalist class, it logically followed that the driving forces of the revolution should correspond to the nation's character. And indeed, there is a wonderful quote from Mykola Porsche, the founding theorist of uh, Ukrainian social democracy, that thus only the proletariat can assume the leadership in the struggle for autonomy. The Ukrainian national movement will not be a bourgeois movement of triumphant capitalism, as in the case of the Czechs. It will be more like the Irish case, a proletarian and a semi-proletarianized peasant movement. And Vinichenko argues in his history, which is quoted also by, by Marco, that everything seemed to follow that course as 1917 unfolded. The movement did appear to reflect that, the nation's character. Uh, and uh, indeed, there were councils pe of peasants, workers and soldiers who formed the RADA, and the leading parties were socialists. Why then ultimately did the social and political forces at work fail in 1917, 1918? Uh, to achieve national independence, uh, this, which is the question posed very much in this book and which seeks to answer. Uh, the very existence of the Rada, I think we should begin by recognising, uh, uh, achieved partly that goal of national emancipation uh, by simply existing. Uh, and by July 1917, it forced the Russian government to officially recognise it as the uh, higher organ for conducting Ukrainian national affairs. And I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that before February 1917, officially, Ukraine did not exist at all. It was Southern Russia, a mere region. Uh, uh, there was no Ukrainian nation in the eyes of the Russian state. That would never be reversed uh, from this point forward. Uh, uh, and so that aspect of national uh, emancipation was significantly achieved if not an independent state, if it wasn't a form of independence. And in historical terms, I would compare the Rada to the Easter Rising or the first Doyle of Ireland in terms of that achievement uh, on it. But by late 1917, it was very clear that at key moments, the leadership of the Centrana Rada had fallen far behind the pace and the aspirations of the popular movement from below. And relations between that largely middle-class leadership, uh, uh, strained with the popular movement. But these difficulties were not about personalities, as Vinichenko would argue, but politics. The prevailing opinion of the Ukrainian parties that, uh, in the Rada leadership was securing autonomy alone was a precondition for progress. Similarly, there was a, 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 a suspicion that if they conceded to the slogans of all power to the Soviets, it would concede the Ukrainian national dimension of the revolution. And this uh, uh, retarding of the revolutionary process was also uh, contributed to, which is revealed very much in, in Marco's point, by the Russian Mensheviks, by the Russian Socialist Revolutionaries, uh, uh, by the Bundes, by these other parties that made up that, that, that new, uh, autonomous government in Ukraine. This wasn't solely a, a Ukrainian affair, as is often presented. Uh, the consequence of this was, uh, regardless of their opinions, the revolutionary process accelerated. The peasants seized the land. By October, most of the factories were under control of factory committees or workers in Ukraine. Uh, uh, and uh, a radical upsurge was uh, growing within the Ukrainian left parties itself uh, by the winter of 1917. This is something which this book is a significant contribution to in that, in that period. Historical orthodoxies before and now, whether it be Stalinist or nationalists, have neglected the radical tendency within the Ukrainian revolution, tended to portray it as external, alien, Bolshevik, Russian, essentially and not something that uh, uh, organically was developing. But uh, uh, in contrast to the revolution in Russia, this radicalization in Ukraine didn't cohere in the same way. In Russia, the popular movement coalesced around a Bolshevik left socialist revolutionary leadership in the Soviets. 
In Ukraine, the chief characteristic, in my view, was one of fragmentation uh, and, uh, uh, of the subjective forces of the revolution. The salient feature was a divergence between notably large sections of the Ukrainian peasantry from sections of the urban workers uh, uh, and within the workers' movement itself, this deep disagreements on how to resolve the, the, the questions posed by the revolution. Across the whole process, there was divisions over solutions of which should take priority of emphasis between the social and the national dimensions uh, of the revolution. And this surfaced and is chron in the chronology of this book was clearly through the late 1917, early 1918. But just as the RADA lagged behind the movement, the urban Soviets for a long time also lagged behind that national dimension for a period. But what is important, I think, that comes through here is that this began to change. Uh, Marker there highlighted the, the number of Soviets which recognised the Ukrainian People's Republic. This represented a significant shift in the consciousness of the working class, this multinational working class in Ukraine, and that doesn't reverse historically either, in my view. Rapprochement between these divergent forces, I believe, was possible for a period. In October, in Kiev, the National Committee for Defence of the Revolution unified all the radical parties, Bolshevik, Menshevik, Ukrainian Social Democrats, Bundes, and in Kharkiv, where workers, peasants and soldier councils had already taken power, the Kharkiv Province Military Revolution Committee combined with the Free Ukrainian Rada to, to take control. These glimmers of a, 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 of a reconciliation were lost over that winter and didn't combine. Uh, uh, and the, the, this was to pose, be, become a tragedy. Uh, part of this, I believe, could be seen already from an earlier period in its explanation. The, the, the social democracy, which was the leading forces in Ukraine at the time, did not fully learn the lessons from the 1905 revolution, but the national question very much came to the fore. Others equally did not fully appreciate the very new organisations they were actually unified in at the time, which were the, the workers' councils, Soviets, which have emerged on a grand scale in 1917. Uh, and those factors, I think, became uh, 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 exacerbated. Uh, the, 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 progress, the, the, the process of retrogression from 1905 to 1917, in some ways, was never fully overcame and new perspectives fully agreed upon in time for the revolution as it unfolded. Holubnitsky, uh, a well-known Ukrainian economist in the 1970s and early 80s, once said that uh, the situation was one where the Ukrainian socialist parties gave away the land in order to be politically popular. But unfortunately, they did not give enough, therefore were not sufficiently popular. And in this way, they failed while Lenin succeeded. Uh, and that could be argued across the social aspects, uh, uh, social questions which arose. And uh, you posed at the beginning a, an interesting question of this comparison, which we call a Porsche made uh, to Ireland. The Rahmanov, one of the founders of the Ukrainian movement, also had made this comparison. Uh, he posed the question, when will we have our Parnells and our Fenian movement? Uh, the Irish experience was also studied by Vinichenko, who desperately sought out the Irish communists when he attended the Communist International Conference in 1920. The experiences, analogies, and, and significant divergencies, in particular, if I was to point to the, in 1913, the Irish labour movement had suffered a, a, a very great defeat in, around the Dublin lockout. Uh, it entered in 1916, rising a few years later, in which the radical socialists and the radical republicans were in that moment defeated and many killed, leaving a, a, a movement that arose in the Irish Revolution without that radical leadership from there. Partition too came about. And if we compare the partitionist movement in Ireland to Ukraine, we can see the, 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 the significant divergencies. The movement that brought the partition of Ireland was from the beginning reactionary, backed by the British Empire, uh, uh, 
it had divided the working class in Northeast Ireland uh, along ethnic lines. That didn't exist across Ireland. Unlike Ukraine and Ireland, there wasn't a British minority in every city. And there wasn't that fragmentation to overcome there. And also the partitionist movement, which we read about in this book, which was experienced in Kriviri and in East Ukraine and in parts of Southern Ukraine in 1917, 1918, reveals itself actually to have very little depth. It didn't last. It never really arose other than in the fantasies of the modern day separatists in Donbass. But, uh, uh, and by the 1918 Second All-Ukraine Congress of Soviets, it was cast aside at the All-Ukrainian Workers' Conference in May of 1918, representing a million workers. This partitionist movement never raised its head again. And that latter conference was overwhelmingly Russian in its uh, composition. Uh, that differs greatly from the, the events in Ireland in, in terms of the partition there and that fragmentation. But that was perhaps the success of the Irish National Revolution in contrast to the situation in Ukraine. There was a greater cohesion and a unity around the goal of a republic as opposed to autonomy, which had already been rejected after the Easter Rising. And in that sense, with that greater cohesion of the, of the movement, uh, there was more chance of success against a far superior force. But on the other hand, Irish labour didn't play the central role that it, was, it could have after 1916 in contrast to Ukraine. That labor movement, which had arose in those decades before, was central to the Ukrainian revolutionary process. In Ireland, it was not. And one consequence of that was Ireland experienced its own hitmany, the, the free state, which was created following a bloody civil war, put in place a republic which was far more conservative, indeed reactionary, than the revolutionary process in Ukraine uh, was able to achieve. If I was to ask uh, the question, if it could be so cheekily, what was achieved when I read this book? I would say the greatest achievement there was the very existence of Ukraine. Uh, it has never been reversed uh, at all, neither by Holodomor, by the Nazi occupation, by anyone. Uh, that never, ever became Little Russia again. And when we look at who achieved that, it was the labour movement who were the key forces that brought that revolution about in that period. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, that's a that's a great place to uh, to that's, that's a great place to. Um, land up and i think that you know it's it's a point i've never thought of like that that yeah ukraine was put in place and through all the things you just mentioned um actually uh was never uh, reversed back uh to little russia now um marco um do you want to do you want to say anything uh in response to yulia and chris um i've got one um, question in in the, in the chat here. We we'll come to in a moment. But do, do you have, have have they said anything to uh, push you on towards some uh, conclusions? I very much like uh, I very much like people refusing to draw um, superficial and unthought out conclusions as they're so often forced to do in academia for. <laughs> uh, reasons that have got nothing to do with actually uh, researching things. So uh, good for you. But ha have have uh, our two panelists put, said anything that takes you on a little? Well, both Chris and Yulia have sort of left a lot of um, issues to uh, to to ponder. And off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not going to venture uh, comments on them. Uh, I'll just say one thing, and that really relates to both of these, their contributions, which is that uh, I became increasingly aware as I researched uh, this subject that the central issue uh, to resolve 
the whole question of Ukraine's existence, I mean, what form, was the problem of unity and maintaining the unity within the working class between its different national sections, uh, which corresponded to other kinds of social uh, geographic stratification. And secondly, the unity between the peasantry uh, and the working class. Peasantry was, after all, the majority of the society. And uh, simply to agree to form um, a government uh, in Ukraine required some kind of um, agreement between the parties to that project as to how would the peasantry uh, and the working class be represented um, um, in that government. Uh, if the prevailing thought in social democracy was uh, that uh, it is the working class that is the leading force in the revolutionary process and the class of the future, well, what the hell do you do with 80% of the population who are not working class and who are exhibiting uh, a revolutionary attitude towards the war and towards land and towards democracy? that is no less radical and uh, equally consistent to that which is being expressed uh, and demanded by the organizations of the working class. Uh, and so the problem was how to achieve and maintain that unity. Uh, and uh, it wasn't only the responsibility of uh, these big social classes and their organizations, however, it was also the context in which this took place. There was an invasion that came from the Russian Soviet Republic into Ukraine, and then there was an invasion that came from the central powers uh, from the West, Germany, Austro-Hungary. That greatly complicated this task uh, as well. And, uh, and if we look at why everything broke down uh, from the end of December into 1918, when people lost when ordinary people lost hope that the socialists could provide order and security and a viable democratic government and could end the war or could take Ukraine out of the war uh, and resolve uh, the land question, when people lost that hope, it was then that the reactionary forces um, raised their head with their alternatives which was to essentialize um, uh, identities into national stereotypes, um, and which was also responsible for uh, the anti-Jewish pogroms that then broke out under the leadership of those reactionary Ukrainian and Russian uh, forces uh, in the army, in the armies that were um, present on the, on, the puppet, on the territory. So the, this question of unity is, for me, sort of like the Archimedean point around which the successes and the failures of the revolutionary process um, rotated and eventually um, uh, when, when the hope was lost uh, in 1918. Okay, thanks. Now, um, we, I'm going to ask those of you who've asked questions in the chat if you want to um, unmute and ask them, because that way uh, everybody else gets more of you and less of me. Um, but if you, if you don't want to for some reason, I can read them out. But uh, Marco uh, Timoshuk, um, if you're there and you want to unmute and say hello, um, Please do and ask your question, or I'll ask it for you. Any sign? Maybe while Marcus thinking about uh, unmuting himself, I can just mention, um, we, we send this in chat as well, but just to remind you, we are recording this uh, event and we will upload it to our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you are asking a question and you don't want to appear on the recording, please keep your 
um, video off. Uh, but if you don't mind appearing on the recording, please keep it on. Uh, it would be nice to see you. Okay, while, while we're... Marco right, said... Could, could I please read it? Yes, I could. And uh, then uh, Kirill Buketov, uh, if, if you want to come in um, after that. Let's, let's take this question first. What, from Marco uh, Timoshuk, thank you. Uh, what comments can a panel make on Makhno's anarchist movement in southeastern Ukraine, and in particular, the shift uh, within anarchism towards a national anarchist ideology during 1918? That is recognizing the importance of the national question. Um, what... What did that do in terms of preserving the anarchist movement within the context of the Ukrainian revolution, within the wider uh, Russian revolution? Um, Marco, and, uh, do, you, do you want to come back on that? Or? Uh, no, I'll defer to the other speakers no. on this one. Anyone? I mean, Chris, yeah? Chris? On the Maknovist movement, obviously, it's a different period from Marco's book. And uh, the Makhno emerges during the insurgency in 1918. But uh, my view of it is I think that uh, Makhno was represented a particular regional movement uh, amongst many that were emerging at that time. It did cross over with wider anarchism, uh, anarchist uh, forces. But uh, I think it was something very particular. To the, to the period of 1919 in Ukraine. Uh, uh, and uh, I would have some criticism of it uh, in, in terms of its uh, uh, sectarianism to a degree towards the other forces who were far larger and also critical of the course of the Russian communists and, uh, and Petlura at the time as well. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. I will also say that uh, I do wish that there was could be translation made of uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, Cherikovers book on the pogroms in Ukraine, which has an entire chapter on the Makhno movement, uh, because I believe that there's always a tendency of us to uh, see uh, paint many forces of that period uh, as perhaps rosier than the others, when none of them were all roses in the garden, and certainly not the Makhnovists, in my view. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks. Now, uh, Kirill um, Buketov, um, do you want to uh, unmute, say hello, ask your question, which is straightforward and practical? Yes. Uh, Hi. I, I can voice it. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, thank you for, for the book. And my question is really very practical. Um, yeah, I, I've seen that uh, the book is published in uh, Ukrainian language, which is uh, very important, of course. Well, that's uh, the purpose. But uh, what do you think about uh, having a Russian translation of the book? Uh, many uh, workers uh, and labor movement activists in Ukraine will appreciate having an opportunity to read it in Russian. And this will also help us actually to talk to our opponents uh, on the other side of the uh, well, <laughs> what used to be Russian Empire. Thank you. Uh, Marco? Uh, thank you, Kirill. That's a very uh, opportune uh, question. Uh, I fully support uh, uh, seeing uh, this book translated uh, into Russian and published. Uh, in fact, I wrote away to uh, uh, the historical mater materialism series people um, who have published this book in in English and proposed that very thing to them? And I said, "Is there, you know, will there be an opportunity to 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 go for a translation into Russian?" I think that I, I support that, and I would be happy to cooperate with uh, anyone who has a serious proposal on that level. Okay, thank you. That's. Uh... That's that's all really good to hear. Um, got a question here from uh, Christopher Gilly. Uh, do you want to uh, unmute and ask the question, uh, Christopher? And then I'm going to come to Graham Campbell, who had his hand up. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, so um, Chris mentioned that many Ukrainian workers were flexible workers, so I presume having um, a connection... St- can you hear me? Yep, we can oh, hear okay. you. I just saw um, faces. Uh, so flexible workers still connect, presumably still connected to the village, and um, they were going to pro- predominantly Russian-speaking uh, cities, and thus presumably um, uh, subjected to uh, strong um, assimilatory processes. So I'm wondering in what concrete ways uh, Ukrainian workers expressed national and class identities in 1917 and possibly um, in the rest of the Civil War period. And also, so basically, in other words, what where, ways were Ukrainian workers Ukrainian and what ways were they workers? Um, who'd like to who'd like to uh, have a go at that? Well, if I if I may sort of come of in course. on this, uh, uh, they express they express themselves in very sort of they express themselves in this way. They uh, they demanded it uh, an end to the war, which for them meant that uh, Ukrainians. Uh, on both sides of the front, in the armies of the central powers, uh, on the one hand, and on the and the, and the uh, Russia in the Entente on the other, not have to kill each other. Um, they demanded the unification uh, uh, of Ukraine under under peaceful uh, circumstances. They they demanded autonomy. Uh, the uh, that the language of instruction in schools uh, be Ukrainian. Uh, uh, or in the language of the local population, as it shows. I mean, they weren't simply for uh, Ukrainian uh, language instruction, but for uh, a policy um, that um, satisfied um, the educational needs um, uh, of majority and minorities, and that required language of instruction in native languages. Uh, they, the uh, in the different political parties, there's uh, quite a bit of evidence that Ukrainian uh, workers uh, began to uh, organize uh, Ukrainian-speaking sections uh, or local branches um, of their political party organization. Uh, in the army. Uh, soldiers demanded that literature that was delivered to the front, that is to say newspapers and books and pamphlets, be delivered in their own language, uh, as well as in Russian. And that took a considerable fight uh, to get. Uh, and so the social democratic parties uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the cities uh, of Ukraine uh, went about collecting literature both in Russian and in Ukrainian eventually, because that is what the soldiers on the front demanded. So it was in these ways that the the building blocks of a a more comprehensive national state uh, alternative to the existing uh, state political system uh, was being sort of assembled in the the consciousness and the actions and the organization of Ukrainian workers. Thanks, uh, Marco. And uh, I mean, my impression from uh, reading the book, and I, I knew almost nothing about this, the details of this history, was um, you can't separate that process of, of the countryside to the cities from the process of the countryside to the army. I mean, just the sheer numbers of young uh, Ukrainian uh, peasant men who were being uh, who, who had been conscripted into the army and the enormously important uh, role that the army played is uh, something which um, is is uh, covered uh, throughout the book. Um, Graham Campbell, uh, are you there? Could you unmute and say hello? And ask yes, I'm there. I'm here. Well, I'm here, not hello. there. Yeah. You know I mean? <laughs> um, so first of all, let me say thank you, Simon, uh, and thank you, Ukraine Institute. Please consider this my application for membership in the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, it's a very niche uh, topic for uh, a London, Glaswegian, Jamaican Scot to be interested in, uh, but I'm 
very happy to show my support for Scotland and it, our links to Ukraine's independence. And I hope that we would speak much louder. And also just to quickly say uh, thank you for to Chris, to Simon uh, in particular, but also there's names in here I recognise who I follow and I've not met before. So thank you for all the scholarship and work you've done throughout my adult lifetime to bring uh, awareness of the Ukrainian revolution and what's its true history and which uh, too few people are aware of. I have to say it was Chris's work on the Boropists that actually when I first came to Scotland in 1994 I was had that in my mind when I was looking at the national question here and I suppose my question will be this is that what role does uh, you know the 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 democratic question play in the, the motivation for the revolutionaries and exactly this this role between the bourgeois democracy versus proletarian democracy on the one hand and also around culture and cultural national questions obviously in scotland today we're we're grappling with questions of political democracy to have an independent country but also around the the cultural dynamics of what kind of socialist society we might become at the end of our breaking up of the great empire that we still haven't quite finished breaking up. So uh, I, I would be very interested to see your your views about the parallels between those two countries. Chris, do you want to come back on that? Thank you, Graham. That is another huge question. <laughs> uh, I think on the, uh, one thing that I would say, I think on that cultural uh, dimension, I think uh, one of the features that I saw uh, from the Ukraine, the, particularly the Ukrainian left parties and Ukrainian social democrats in that period was this uh, uh, simultaneously being linked with a cultural dimension. So, for example, I think I read particularly in Donbass, which some people imagine is not Ukrainian anymore, but it was. Uh, and uh, all the part branches of the Ukrainian Social Democrats were linked to or the same people basically running a Prusvita society of, uh, uh, in terms of a culture, culture activities and had their meetings in these uh, uh, buildings of Prusvita uh, clubs uh, in Donbass. And uh, this was a widespread thing. Uh, uh, the, 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 so I think, I, I think that uh, when, although I said that the this, there was a move to address the national question as a social issue. It didn't mean that workers weren't uh, addressing uh, other issues uh, at the time. For, so, for example, uh, even before the revolution, uh, there was famous petitions from workers in uh, Katerinoslav to the representative in the, in the Duma, uh, arguing for greater Ukrainian language rights uh, 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 at the time. The, this wasn't coming from intellectuals, it was from industrial workers, uh, uh, which were being highlighted. Uh, in, t in terms of the, the, the democratic dimension, I, I think that uh, Marcus Berg really chronicles this very well, that the, the, this period uh, is like a, a, a multitude of forms, of new forms of democracy coming into creation. Uh, obviously, the, there emerges a conflict, how do we reconcile them, how can they work together, but they all, in the main, they are coming from below. Uh, workers' councils, factory committees, uh, uh, soldiers' committees, peasants' unions, peasants' uh, councils, uh, uh, land committees to redistribute the land. Uh, uh, and all of this was a democratic question. Uh, so f far from this mass of largely illiterate people being incapable of uh, taking control of their lives, this process really shows something flourishing from below of people taking a democratic initiative to control how they live and how they want to run their society on a, on a grand scale. Uh, uh, and it doesn't end because it, uh, after the, that 1917, 1918, 1918, they keep recreating these things and struggling to recreate them, uh, these organisations. Uh, I, I think one, of the, one, one aspect that did jump to me that's relevant to Scotland uh, point you made is uh, that I I think that uh, uh, there was there wasn't false opposites from what I could see in, in, in many ways between what people saw as independence and self-government and federalism uh, and uh, and I think that's something that can speak to today uh, that uh, there isn't necessarily a contradiction between independence and federalism in some in some regards uh, 
But one thing that really does jump out to me is you can't have it if the other side is hostile to her. And in that, I was meaning the position of what, whichever government was in Russia or, or, in, on, or in London, for that matter. Uh, so I, th I think there was a great many experiments taking place there uh, and ideas coming forward on how to solve the national question that we could learn from uh, at that time. Thanks very much, uh, Chris. I'm, I'm looking at my watch. I'm going to try and get as many of these questions in as I can. Can we have uh, William uh, Blacko? Could you uh, unmute and ask your question? Are you there? No, nowhere to be seen. Do you want me to read it out? I think he's uh, unmuted now. All oh, right. Okay. William. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, sorry for the delay. Yeah, so thanks for such a, a brilliant uh, discussion. Uh, my question is about how all of this is remembered today. Um, so, you know, the, the whole, the events of the Ukrainian revolution have been kind of revived recently because because of the centenary, but it's more been about a kind of um, uh, state-building narrative uh, rather than the uh, and the kind of the socialist element, the left-wing ele element has been kind of uh, sidelined a little bit. So I wonder what, what you think are the, the prospects for this heritage being sort of recovered and even celebrated in, in Ukraine today. And obviously we know that there's a whole, the whole history since then um, of, and, and sort of left-wing ideas and ideology have a certain reputation in Ukraine and, and they, they kind of struggle on the political stage uh, in Ukraine at the moment. So I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. I'm, I'm going to come to Yulia with that first. Um, Yulia? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much, William. Uh, an excellent question. And indeed, uh, this is something that, that's on my mind a lot. Uh, not least because, as, as you say so, um, so accurately, the uh, left-wing politics do have uh, a bad name uh, and uh, uh, there, there are still anti-communist laws in place. And there is, there is a lot of... Um, uh, public frustration at socioeconomic deprivation, which is completely understandable, that gets channeled because it something's got to give. It, a lot of it gets channeled into blaming the communists, blaming the um, the Soviets, uh, and anything that had to do with USSR for anything that thirty years on oligarchs have destroyed, and and together with uh, you know with some helpers from abroad. So in that kind of context, of course, it is really difficult to, to have these meaningful conversations. And as scabbard, but at the same time, I, I tend to draw a very, very pessimistic picture, but I do want to put a little bit of optimism in here, because as critical as I am of, um, of the presidency of Zelensky and the servant of the, part, the, servant of the people party, um, whether it's lip service or not, they are trying to stay away from this army language, uh, uh, you know, unity, whatever mantras of Poroshenko's time. And they are trying to, to mend, even if discursively, set some rifts that have been created in the society. And, I, and not least because there is a lot of pressure from the EU about right-wing violence, amongst other things, and you need to make look, things look civil. So I think within that context, however small, there is an opportunity to start having these conversations, um, uh, perhaps with more careful language. And that, that pains me quite a lot. Uh, um, but I do recognize that uh, if we, if if, if conversations are to be had uh, about the historical, uh, certain historical context uh, with certain language to which by now large segments of population have developed a knee-jerk reaction allergy sort of things, you can't get very far. And that is quite frustrating. But at the same time, you know, it doesn't mean that this work shouldn't be done or it can't be done. But the thing is that is precisely why more of it needs to be done. And I think a Marcos book being translated into Ukrainian is one that one fantastic contribution to opening up that conversation. And even if it is, uh, you know, around the state building, I think uh, 
if we start having those conversations on the on the forums and platforms where the you know, the addressing of the Ukrainian revolution question starts happening around the, the state building, and narratives can be introduced about who was responsible for the Ukrainian revolution. And then from there, it can be taken further. This is my optimistic sort of past strategy, if you like. But I think this is also precisely why I think that the, the style in which Marco's writing and the meticul meticulousness with which um, with which he documents what was happening on the ground and who was responsible for what without necessarily siding with anybody or, or having any agenda besides explaining what has gone down is extremely important because those kind of neutral political, neutrally politically framed texts um, really help start building a dialogue. It's not who are you with and, you know, if you're not with me, you're my enemy. It's rather, okay, let's sit down and figure out what actually went down. Because yes, there were a lot of problems in, in the Soviet historiography. And yes, in diasporic certain historical texts, there, were, there was also, there were some problems. But our job as scholars and our job as societies is to examine our histories, learn from past mistakes, and also mend the schisms and animosities, especially in the state of uh, in the state of social disarray as it is in Ukraine right now. So I think it's precisely this kind of work that needs to be happening, and there, I, I think there is a window of opportunity there, as but the population is also getting, despite this kind of like allergy that's been pushed on them towards anything Soviet or communist. People are very tired of ongoing conflict. They're very tired of animosity. They're very frustrated. They've been pitched against each other, and they're like you know they. They're beginning to realize more, more soberly, if you like, that they are pitched against each other and that they need to think for themselves and kind of try to organize a bit better. So I think, I think there is a space. I think there is a space. I'm hopeful. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think these conversations need to be had uh, when, when they open. Thank you. Okay, uh, Yulia, thanks very much. Now, uh, we're, we're in danger of running over time. We're living in an age of Zoom fatigue. So I'm going to very quickly put three questions to Marco and uh, then uh, wrap up and um, uh, call it an extremely good evening's work. The first question, um, Marco, is um, from, where's it gone? Where has it gone? Um, it's from, and I, I, I'm just going to read these out myself to speed things up. Thank you very much for these questions. So Richard Fiddler asks, uh, he says he looks forward to reading these books. Do you plan a sequel to this volume to cover the complex relations between the Russian Soviet regime and the Ukrainian national and social movement after 1917? And what I'm going to say to Richard is that when you get to the final page of this book, there's an epilogue which talks about the cycles of struggle through 1918, 1919, and ending in February 1920, when the Red Army really establishes control over Ukraine, which is not subsequently reversed. And the last sentence, um, sorry for the spoiler, the last sentence is, these two cycles of the revolution are the subject of further work. So, um, that, but Marco, if you've got anything to add yourself, please do. But I'm going to uh, just to tell you the other two questions. So one is from James Wagman, and he's basically asking, um, what about the Ukrainians in the Austro-Hungarian regions? Did they work with or against the worker movements in Ukraine proper? So right over in the west of what is today uh, Ukraine. Uh, what what class did they belong to? Um, that's about uh, the Austro-Hungarian regions. And then the final question is from me, which is, do, is there anything further you want to say as you wind up? So, Marco. Thank you. Uh, to uh, Richard, uh, I do plan to carry on. Uh, I, have, I do have a draft uh, of the second and third cycles of the revolution up to February 1920, but it's a very old draft and I have to put quite a bit of work into it. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, that I will have the strength to do that. And I do, do intend to bring uh, this history to a certain uh, conclusion with the, uh, the end of the 
the, the Civil War. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, is the answer to your question. Uh, uh, to James, uh, Austro-Hungary, uh, I deliberately uh, omitted the dealing with Austro-Hungary because of its, it, because uh, Ukraine was for so long, you know, after the partitions of Poland, uh, broken up into different uh, entities and Austro and Western Ukraine under um, Austro-Hungary uh, evolved uh, in, in, in quite different ways. But in uh, 19, um, uh, 17, 1918, these links were re-established uh, between uh, the uh, Ukrainian People's Republic and the Western Ukrainian People's Republic, which was declared in, in 1918, but it was with enormous difficulty uh, that um, these links were re-established and uh, the, uh, the central powers made sure uh, from the end of 1917 that anyone crossing the border, of the, which was the war front uh, between uh, Kiev and uh, central Ukraine over into Western Ukraine was so tightly controlled that representatives of that other had great difficulty in uh, establishing cooperation, for example, with the representatives of the Western Ukrainian People's Republic uh, uh, and their predecessors, as they went into the Brest-Litovsk talks to bring an end to the war, for example. It was very, very difficult. But that's as far as I've gotten um, into 1918. But these, the, this issue um, raises its head much more strongly later uh, uh, during um, the conflicts that then break out uh, uh, during the Civil War and when Western Ukraine is much more involved in the military uh, fighting. Uh, I, I have nothing else to add but to say uh, that I've greatly um, enjoyed and appreciated this discussion. Um, and uh, it's uh, really heartening to see uh, uh, and to hear uh, your comments. And uh, I look forward to carrying on this discussion in any form that uh, we can do so. Thank you. Okay, Mark, a, a huge thank you to you. And I'll now uh, hand back to Alessia. Thank you very much. And I'd just really like to thank all our speakers today, Marco Butun, for your absolutely excellent book and your contributions today, Yule Yur. Uh, Yurchenko and Christopher Ford uh, for such a rich discussion and Simon Pirani for moderating uh, so beautifully uh, tonight and uh, thank you to all of you for attending um, this, um, uh, this discussion and we really hope to see you at our future events. <laughs> Silent clapping on Zoom. <laughs> thank you very much and have a good night. <laughs>